All right, we've got a good few folks here and looks like the number of people trickling in is starting to slow down some. Um, so with that, we will uh, we'll get jump into it. So hello everyone. Um, my name is Chris Gentry. Uh, I am the training director of the Progressive Turnout Project. Uh, we are the largest grassroots funded field organization in the country uh, that focuses on targeting uh, inconsistent Democrats and getting them to the polls. Uh, I use here they pronouns, and I'm out here based out of Chicago. And Kelsey Fritz, I am a district operations director with Progressive Turnout Project out of the Denver East office. So I get to interact directly with our amazing field staff. Uh, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm sitting here in Aurora, Colorado. So today, uh, the title of our workshop is a messaging workshop called Your Friends Are Doing It, Using Social Pressure to Boost Voter Turnout, talking specifically about dynamic social expression and its implications on messaging. So, Kelsey, you want to get us started? That's sure thing. So we're going to, yeah, we're talking about dynamic social expression um, in action, but we're going to start off by giving you a good idea as to why we're actually qualified to, to speak on this topic. So PTP uh, was founded in 2015. Um, in 2016, we started to run our first field programs. We were on the ground in six competitive congressional districts, and we also ran digital mail and phone programs in 13 others. In 2017, we ran robust field programs in Virginia specifically um, to help to flip 10 Republican held district as, as House district seats in the Virginia House of Delegates. In 2018, we scaled up quite a bit and we ran field operations in 18 congressional districts across the country and successfully helped to flip 15 of them, including Congressional District 6 here in Colorado where I began working with, uh, with PTP. That seat was held by an incumbent Republican for over a decade and I'm so happy that we have flipped it blue. Um, and now we're here in 2020 where we are working across in several congressional districts across 17 states. So 2018 is where we have our most data. Um, and we can see that from the work that we did in 2018, we helped to boost, boost voter turnout by a whopping 10.4%. So how can we talk about this? Well, we often structure, structure our, our field programs as if they are experiments so that we can actually measure the, the impact that our program has and to test different tactics, particularly messaging. So to structure it as an experiment, uh, we of course have to have a control and a treatment group. So we identify our voters and we, uh, using our targeting, and we have a portion of them that are a control who we do not attempt to reach out to, and a much larger portion that is our treatment group where we're attempting to contact every voter. It doesn't mean we reach every voter, but we are attempting them usually multiple times. So Here's one example that really kind of shows the, the work that we did and the impact that we've had. In Iowa, which is my home state in 2013, or 2018, we worked in the third congressional district. We identified 78,000 low turnout voters and a portion of them was a control, a portion of them was our treatment. We did 86,883 door knocks and the results were amazing. We, had, we showed that uh, we had a 13.2% higher turnout in the voters that we treated meaning that our treatment voters turned out at a rate of 78.5%, where the control only turned out at 653 So many field programs, they only have a margin of success of both boosting that voter turnout somewhere between four and 6%. In 2018, like I mentioned, we've averaged a turnout increase of 10.4%. So how did we do that? In many ways, we use the same tactics that every other field program does. We door knock, we send mailers, we make calls, we send texts, uh, we do social media. But one of the major differences that we have, and well, we do do other things. We do, we start early. That's something that, that's really awesome. We reach out to voters multiple times um, and we target the, the right voters. We think those, uh, those voters that aren't, are likely to be democratic, but aren't as likely to turn out. But one of the major differences and the one that we're focusing on for the purposes of this training is the messaging that we use. So throughout any cycle, we are trying out different messaging techniques to figure out how to get the most voters to turn out. 
and uh, the core of what techniques we are using is related to what our theory of the case is. So for our purposes, the theory of the case means what we actually believe, what we actually believe motivates voters to get out and vote. So here are some of the most common reasons why we think people are motivated to vote or why many of us in political spaces believe that people are motivated to vote because it's in your best interest, which of course it is because all of your friends are doing it, which they should be because it's your civic duty, which again, it is, or because they care about a specific issue, which I hope everyone does. Whatever the reason you subscribe to informs how you're going to create that messaging, right? If you believe that the reason that people are motivated to vote is because it's in their best interest, then you might approach them about specific policies that they should really be voting for. If you believe that the reason why they're going to vote is going to be because their friends are doing it, you'd be using a social pressure messaging, which is a lot of what we're talking about today. And if you think it's going to be because they believe it's their civic duty, then you just want to amplify the voices of other voters and the, that communal feeling, all the rah, rah, America sort of messaging. Ultimately, all of these theories of the case make an assumption, and that assumption is that voting is a rational act, which we know that it, 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 not, it isn't always. And so I'm going to pass it over to Chris so he can talk a little bit more about the nitty gritty of the messaging. Yeah. So essentially, basically, for most time, even now, right, we tend to think that uh, voting is inherently a rational policy act, right? Where I go, ah, oh, yes, let me add three for good, uh, good social justice messaging, subtract two for climate change, add one for voter suppression. Oh, looks like I'm voting Democrats this election and I'm voting. But that's not actually how things work. First of all, there's the myth of the swing voter, uh, which I think has been like, we've kind of slowly kind of begun to realize that there aren't that many swing voters in actuality, right? So that's thing one. Thing two is that at the end of the day, we don't mostly vote because of policy. And even the policies we do vote for, there's not individualized or rational policies we're voting for. Instead, what we believe is that voters are voting for what we call a dynamic social expression. Now, what this means in practice is that voting is the way that we express our identity as part of a social group. Express our identity as part of a social group. So this idea is not particularly new. It's about two cycles old at this point in political science timeline. So in 2012, Alan Gerber, Todd Rogers, and Craig Fox wrote this paper that kind of is the crux of this strategy uh, that is called Rethinking Why People Vote, Voting as a Dynamic Social Expression. Right. That was the kind of where the core of this information comes from. So what that paper did was is it analyzed lots of historical reasons and motivations that motivate folks to show up and vote. So let's break this down some. So the dynamic is a thing that most campaigns are most familiar with. Dynamic means that the events before and after the election impact if someone votes. Right. So that's what you see most campaigns doing. That's your vote plans. That's your uh, commitment to vote cards, stuff like that. The social says that we vote in favor of specific social groupings, specifically our identities and our communities. And the expression is that we vote as an expression of those identities and communities. So let's break this down some. Dynamic. So before the election, predicting and making a plan to vote makes voting more likely. So if I say, yes, I am going to vote on Tuesday, November the 3rd, I am now making this public commitment to the world that I'm going to vote on Tuesday, November the 3rd, and that psychologically registers, oh, Chris, you're voting on Tuesday, November the 3rd. Boom, it clicks that into place. Same thing with vote plans. So if I'm like, ah, yes, I am going to go take my 1995 Honda Civic, drive it to the polling place at 8.30 in the morning with my grandma, and we're going to vote early on whatever, right? Like that is a plan. And what's happening psychologically, right, is that psychologically we're thinking to ourselves, oh, right, 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 voting. And that psychological thinking about yourself voting is what kind of keeps that vote plan and with why it works, right? Um, reminding voters of those vote plans and those commitments also helps make some folks show up to vote. So that's the pre and post election thing. So if I send them back their commit to vote card, they'll go, right, I did say I was going to commit to vote in November. Right? And then also after the election, things like social pressure and accountability makes, for, makes folks more likely to vote next time. So if they think that I'm going to knock on their door 
and be like, so uh, you told me you were voting. What happened with that? You know, you didn't actually show up and do it. That's how we, that, that is like the, the before and after the election element of things, right? So what this looks like in practice is the thing that I'm sure is not new to you all, right? This is some from Lars from last cycle, right? But commit to vote cards are a tried and two method of a field organizing that we've done for years based off this theory, right? Based off the idea that predicting and committing vote, you're gonna vote increases turnout. And we have tons and tons of evidence saying that it does in fact do that, right? And these are our commit to vote cards and our vote plans from our organization, but you've seen these, I'm sure you've signed plenty of them yourself. Now I want to, I want to, to note what RSA at the top left corner, uh, specifically that the first issue is I care about my community. We're going to come back to that point. So keep a pin in that. Also, when folks feel like they may be asked to justify their inaction or think that they're being observed, they're more likely to vote. So if you're like, hey, Jimmy, I'm going to follow up with you after the election to see if you voted. People, people tend to be more likely to follow through with their commitments, even though there's no like penalty for not voting. It's because they feel socially accountable. Specifically, if they think the person that is observing them or making them justify their inaction is part of their perceived community. Now, that is one of the key critical points to this. So the social, this is where we really get our meat and potatoes out of this. So social basically says that we vote in favor of our social groups. We like to tie our identities and our votes to those of similar backgrounds. We're influenced by what we think others in our community are doing, and we want our communities to think that we vote. Okay, so first of all, when we talk about community, I think that there is a lot of times that when we say community, we think other things, right? We think, oh, my neighborhood, my small town, my whatever, right? And that's sort of true, but that's not really what we're looking for. But community, what we mean is anything that you have tied to what you associate yourself with. That could be your local community, or it could be the soccer team you play on, or the church you go to, or you consider maybe your community is broader, it's, you know, Southern Appalachia or something, right? So the idea is that we vote in favor of our community. So that community can be your friends, your family, your ethnic community, right? And we want to use terms and messaging that ties the act of voting to the benefit of your perceived community, right? So oftentimes this often looks like, oh, look, like this is how you benefit your friends or your neighborhood. But recognizing the fact that I don't know about y'all, but that's not how I think of community now. I don't really know my neighbors that well. We'll get back to this as well. This is the most important and often underlooked part of dynamic social expression. We don't vote for ourselves. We don't even really vote for our friends. We vote for our communities and our perceived identities. Okay. This is why we think community, we, we want our community, uh, we want to think that our community is voting, right? So basically that means is that we in political science have kind of gotten our heads around that we want to always talk about high turnout, right? We always want to talk about high turnout. That's a pretty commonly held term now, right? But it's, what's an important thing to realize is what works even better is if you think that your specific voters are turning out. So like, if I see something that's like, oh, Chicago is voting at record level, that, that's mildly interesting. If it's like, hey, Pilsen is voting at record level, then suddenly your inaction might be, you might be asked to justify your inaction by your actual social group, by your actual friends, by your actual community. When people, when people uh, we like to people to think that we're voting, specifically the people that we identify with, right? So if I identify as someone who is a veteran, right? And I basically think that uh, I want other veterans or other people that identify like me, right, to think that I'm voting, right? There was a study that was done like a decade and a half ago that uh, didn't have super conclusive results, but seemed to suggest that the mere presence of I voted stickers increases turnout because it pushes people on people's social pressure buttons. Lastly is expression, right? So the idea is that we take all of these things we take these identities, we take the social pressures, we take these uh, commit to vote cards and vote plans, and we mix them all together, and this it comes expressed in whatever action you want them to take. Now, the action, what we're usually talking about is voter turnout. So we take someone's identities and we take these dynamic like vote plans, commitments, et cetera, 
and this like community social pressure and we get them to vote. This expression can be other things as well. It can also be things like volunteering. It can be things like commitments to things, but we can get into that as well later. That being said, there is a key difference between social pressure and dynamic social expression. Kelsey's going to hit on this though. Awesome. So yeah, dynamic social expression is part, of course, of a uh, of of social pressure. We're going to talk about some of the different ways that we do uh, <laughs> that we do. Thanks for that. I appreciate that, Norman. Um, that we uh, do social pressure. Chris, can you hit the next slide? I got you. So social pressure comes in three forms uh, generally. So there's soft social pressure, hard social pressure, and negative social pressure. So soft social pressure um, often looks like those I'm a voter stickers that Chris was talking about. That's soft social pressure, showing to your friends that you have voted. Uh, it's about motivating your, your, your social group to, to vote in an indirect sort of way. So it's Facebook posts, it's a, that picture of yourself dropping off your ballot at the drop box, that's soft social pressure. Hard social pressure is that direct ask. One of the phrases that we use most commonly in our scripts is, can I count on you to vote? Can you commit to vote? And I'm sure every other field program uses similar language. That hard ask, that is the hard social pressure. This is obviously one of the best ways to encourage people to vote and to get people to follow through, but it's notoriously a difficult thing to scale up. And then negative social pressure is simply put shame. So those those ads that get you to check on your registration or the registration of your friends, those are voter scorecards or even voter report cards where maybe you get a grade in the mail and it turns out you're only getting a C on voting when you should be getting an A plus. Everybody should be getting an A plus in voting. Uh, we did something around this earlier on back in my, not just my home state, but my home city of Des Moines where we set out, sent out those, those voter, voter report cards so that you could compare your voting record to the voting record of your community. It's, it's effective, but it doesn't feel great, right? Voting isn't just an obligation to your friends, it's one to your identity. Dynamic social expression redefines social pressure to focus on your identity as a voter or someone who votes. It defines us not simply as social beings, but as beings that belong to a community. Now, Chris is generous enough with his time and uh, his openness that he's going to share about his identities. Yeah, so one of the things that I want to talk about is that we often, again, like to think of social pressure as in like pressure from your friends, right? You think of that peer pressure thing you saw in dare in school, right? The, the, the person bullying you, like pressuring you to doing drugs or something because that's the social pressure, right? But in reality, the social pressure is more, and specifically dynamic social expression, is about your community, and your community is inherently tied to your identity, right? So as people, we of course carry multiple stacked identities, right? There's a whole school of academia that's based on studying this. So, like, for example, myself, I identify as a Christian and a Southerner, specifically Southern Appalachia, an American, a leftist, a veteran, right? I, these are all these, like, stacked identities of who I personally identify as, right? And the idea is that these inherent identities are inherently tied to what we view as our own community, right? So, if I consider myself to be a Christian, I consider other people that are also Christians to be a part of my community as someone that's from Southern Appalachia. So like, for example, my partner is also from Southern Appalachia, right? We didn't know each other at all, right? But I consider ourselves to be part of that same community because we have that same core identity. I consider myself to be an American, right? And that partially is like what it means to be an American. Whenever you're abroad, you meet other Americans. You're like, ah, yes, we are part of the same community. I consider myself to be a leftist or a veteran, right? And therefore tie those things into what it means to be a veteran. So, those identities are inherently tied to communities, right? Because basically at the end of the day, who I identify as, I find community with other people that identify as those same ways, right? This is especially the case, right? Because local identity monikers are increasingly declining. The example, I guess I mentioned before, is like your neighbors, right? The idea, we often talk about communities or community leaders. We are often referring to uh, kind of more traditional communities, right? Like small towns, super tight-knit neighborhoods, et cetera, and thus those do still exist. But increasingly, they're becoming less common. 
I don't think, don't know about y'all, but other than occasionally dropping off cookies, I don't really know my neighbors that well. What we mean by community is more expansive. It can be those big things like I'm talking about, like Christians or Southerners or Americans or leftists or veterans, but my community is also my soccer team. My community is also my dance friends. My community is the, the people that I go on hikes with, right? Like those are our communities. And when we're talking about being held accountable by our communities for our actions in the case of voting or inaction and not voting, that's who we're actually referring to, right? So one of the things that we do at PTP is we have a lot of messaging that's all about tying identities to the act of voting, right? Or being a voter, being an identity in itself. So uh, one of the things we did, uh, we, we gave out these materials that said, I am a blank voter on them. We hold them, uh, we hold them our I am a voter cards. On the back of the cards with information on voting. But one of the things we asked folks to do was to take pictures of themselves holding these voter cards with what kind of voter they are on them. So you get things like, I am a Mexican voter. I am a woman voter. I am a black voter. I am a young voter. I am a concerned voter, committed voter. I'm a veteran, I'm a parent voter. And then also some really cute dogs, which are of course legally allowed to vote as long as they count dog years, right? The idea is, is that dynamic social expression, pressure, what it does is it ties the community to the act of voting and encourages you to vote for the community, right? So the idea is that I identify as a union member and therefore I vote to support organized workers as they struggle for a better workplace or I identify as a parent, right? And I vote to support uh, better education for both my kids and the kids in my community. I identify as a soccer player and I vote to make it so that we can have better youth athletics, right? In our systems up and down, uh, up and down our grade schools, right? Whatever it is, the idea is that we are, we vote as an act of solidarity with our communities and therefore we vote um, as a member of that identity. Now this is especially important because what this suggests that we should do is to suggest that we should stop talking about policies and instead we should start talking about how, uh, how voting affects communities. So the idea is that the policy is whatever, it's how does that policy change things in your community and how does that policy change things for whatever identities you hold. So one of the things that I'm gonna ask folks to do in a second, I'm gonna give an example, right? Is one of the ways you can best express this is by taking the things that we typically think of as identities and realizing that for the most part, those are actually, so, 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 so back up a second. Um, most of the time, if you ask a political person like what, why they, they work in politics. They'll say something like, oh, I vote in politics because of housing justice or LGBTQ rights or women's rights or environmental justice or whatever, right? But what we're suggesting and what I'm postulating is that at the end of the day, what you care about is inherently tied to who you are. Let me give some examples on that, right? So I, uh, if you, like, yes, I run the gambit of support of progressive policies. At the end of the day, I really, really, really care, right, about uh, immigration justice, uh, police reform, uh, environmental justice, and housing rights. And I can tie all of those things directly back to the kind of person that I am. So I'm from Southern Appalachia. Specifically, my home area has a, I, I'm from this very specific creek. My family has lived there its entire life. And I watched that creek was destroyed, right? I watched that creek that I identify, that identify very strongly with being my home um, was destroyed and polluted and by, from, from one of the, the big mills down the river. I watched as a lot of the forests were cut down and the mountains were removed. And therefore my inherent identity as someone from Southern Appalachia is inherently tied to environmental justice. Or where I live now, I've, for the last three or four years as a Christian, uh, which I identify very strongly as, um, my churches I've gone to for the last four years have been overwhelmingly immigrant based, right? Overwhelmingly immigrant based. Uh, and therefore, part of what it means to me to be a Christian is inherently tied to the act of, uh, of, of fighting for immigration justice because that is what it means to be, to be a Christian. Okay. So what I'm asking if anyone is willing to raise their hand and step up is that if someone who, if they're willing to express what one part of their identity is, and how it relates to something that they care about. Can I get a volunteer?
Norman, what's up? Let me see if I can make you talk. Can you, can you just... uh, I might not be able to, to. I grew up very poor and many months. Go ahead, Kelsey. Oh, I was going to do exactly what you were doing. I just saw the chat. <laughs> yeah. If you want to put yours in the chat then, Norman, because I'm having issues getting you to, to, to getting your audio thing to come through. But Tim's example is I grew up very poor and many of my friends are still very poor, which informs how to people. Yes, very much so, right? Because essentially at a certain point, right, you're uh, being tied to like class politics, right? And like, like identifying as a member of the working class, right? Um, and therefore informs your politics going forward. I think Norman, I think you're able to unmute yourself and give your example. Maybe. Regardless, right, the point is, is that who we are and who we identify as informs the issues that we care about and the way we express those issues. So what do we do about that? What is that? How does that inform our messaging and how does that inform what we should be doing politically going forward? So what, that, what we're asking folks to do is instead of talking about specific policies, focus on the impact on community values, right? So. Instead of being like, let um, me give a good example. If, uh, let's say, Cal Cunningham, who is my, from my home state of North Carolina, right? Instead of being like, Cal Cunningham is working very hard to pass uh, Medicare expansion to for whatever number of people. That's mildly interesting, right? And it's really important. Instead, be like, you know, do we want to say, you know, Cal, you know, uh, you target this towards specific groups. We say, um, I have watched as all my rural hospitals have closed down and it took take my friends and family over an hour to get to the local hospital, right? We have to have real systematic change to our medical system, right? Um, and Cal Cunningham can provide that, blah, 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 blah. The idea is instead of focusing on the issues or the policies, which at the end of the day, most voters don't care about. Instead, what we need to do is focus on how that impacts the communities themselves. So, the example is vote on November the 3rd for Roy, Governor Roy Cooper. With Roy, you can trust that his dependable leadership and his support for school funding will guide North Carolina into the future. That's mildly interesting, right? But it doesn't focus on the communities or the identities associated therein, right? Another example is a way that I may be rewarding this is North Carolina school systems are the backbone of our community. We need strong leadership to support our students and our teachers. So the second one basically allows the, the person you're talking to to identify as students, teachers, parents, right? And talk about how this and this specific case, Roy Cooper, right, will support their community. So what we're gonna do real quick uh, is if y'all are willing to, to participate with us in this, uh, I'm gonna drop a link into the chat. Uh, what there is in this is we're gonna have two exercises real quick, right? Basically both of them are um, examples of messaging from major candidates that I found just while out there on the internet, uh, one about Steve Bullock and one about Mark Kelly. Um, what I'm going to ask folks to do is to spend just three or four minutes and rewrite those using that community language we just talked about. So the first one is Steve Bullock is a governor that works for Montanans. Well, governor, he passed 78 bills regulating pharmaceuticals, restricting big agriculture companies, and supporting Montana schools. In, in Washington, Steve Bullock will do the same. He'll work across the aisle to help, uh, to help all Montanans get a leg up. The second one being Mark Kelly served our country in several tours of duty in Operation Desert Storm. He worked with our allies to fight the insurgents that were destabilizing the region. He believes in country over party. Donald Trump has weakened our, our country both at home and abroad. It is time that patriots like Mark step up and do their duty to protect and serve this great nation. Those are both examples of actual messaging from the candidates themselves, right? But the idea is how can we use the language of community and community and dynamic social expression to make those better? So folks gonna spend, uh, three or four minutes take, going through that, and then I will give some answers to these in a second.
Sorry about that. Oh, there should be a link that was dropped. Oh, uh, that went to all panelists. I'm sorry about that. Whoopsies. There's the actual link. That makes things much more simple. There, yeah, I just noticed my, there's only one person up there. There that is. There everyone is. Thank you very much for noticing that, Allie. There we are. Much better. We'll give about one more minute and then we'll talk we'll talk about some of these examples. And also why the messaging in these examples are good and or bad. All right, let's talk about some of these real quick. So in a second, I'm going to get what, what uh, suggestions you have all, you all have for changing these. But let's talk about why the first one's bad. So uh, what the community, what community does anyone think the first one is if it was targeting anyone, who is it targeting? What identity is it targeting? The only one I can think of is Montanan semi vaguely? Is it trying to target what it means to be Montanans? Yeah, Montanans in general. But it doesn't say anything about what it means to be Montanan and how and how voting for Steve Bullock has anything really what it means to how has any relationship to what it means to be Montanan other than maybe hard working maybe. But even then, it's pretty vague and we want things to be explicitly stated, right? Yeah, it, it tries to target the idea of swing voters, but again, we also don't really think those are really real. It doesn't really, it doesn't really hit on anything. Um, the second one as well, right? The second one, if anything, it's trying to target people that identify as like Americans or patriots, right? But even then, um, veterans right, as well. Um, but even then, it doesn't massively actually explain how things affect the community, right? So if you're trying to come up with a, an answer for how you would talk about messaging that impact Montanans, right? You take about what you think it means to be Montanan, right? Maybe that is, you know, maybe it's that is hardworking. And if it is hardworking, then that should be your answer, right? It shouldn't be just, oh, look, he passed 78 bills. Talk about how, like, this affects the community that is Montanans and what it means to be Montanans. If you're trying to talk about veterans, right, 
instead of being making this focus of this message, which is about his duty, his, him fighting overseas the Operation Desert Storm, make it about how he is supporting fellow veterans, right? And he is do and he is doing his duty as a veteran, which in this case for him, his duty is running for office, right? And so you make the message, you know, Mark Kelly served our country. Along, him, along as well as many other great veterans, have worked uh, to put country over party and uh, to advance, you know, peace and justice both at home and abroad. Uh, Donald Trump you know, has, weakened, has weakened this country both at home and abroad amongst the views of our allies. It is time that we patriots like Mark and other veterans step up and do their duty to uh, protect and serve this great nation or something like that. Right. And the idea of making this very raw, raw patriotism, but you're specifically appealing to a community group that is veterans. So, right, the idea is that dynamic social expression can be used and should be applied to messaging across the board, right? So, uh, one of the, this is an example, one of the ads that we've done in the past, right? Specifically talking about. I'm voting because it's important to have my voice heard. I care about economic reform. I am voting to keep families together. To protect social security. Because I care about the environment. All Americans deserve access to health care. I am tired of being scared to send my children to school. I'm voting because there should be no homeless veterans. Because it's time for a change. Voting matters. Voting matters. Voting matters. Voting matters. Voting matters. But the idea is that, like, to do this even better, right, is you have people say, you know, I am voting because I am a whatever, right? I'm a voting because I'm a union member. I'm voting because I'm a veteran. And that voting is inherently tied to what it means to be a veteran, a union member, etc. cetera. Um, in scripts, the way that our scripts typically are functioned um, is we want folks to talk about their community. So I want to see all the think back, right, uh, to our, that, that first top point we have on our version of the commit to vote card. Our commit to vote card's first thing, right, is I want to support my community, right? The idea is that voting is inherently an act of community solidarity. There's a really interesting study that with semi good results um, from the leadership lab back down in Los Angeles. Uh, they ran a script where they asked folks, who do you love? And, and or they also asked folks, who is your community? And uh, they used that as a basis of a highly effective script that would basically have a 10 minute conversation with a voter about who they love, which often came out of as their friends, their family, uh, their significant other, the, their grandma, their aunt next door, their neighbors, whatever, right? And then the second point of the script was then to tie whoever they love and basically have that act of love into an expression of voting. The idea is that inherent in loving your community or loving your family or your friends is the act of voting. Now, let's kind of transition this slightly, right? I mentioned before dynamic social expression. Uh, the expression that we typically refer to is voting, but that doesn't have to be the case. That expression could be uh, volunteering, right? That could be signing this thing, whatever. Right? The idea is you want to make it an expressor messaging. So it basically, it goes, reads as follows. In order to be a, because I know that you are a blank identity or a part of blank community, right? Inherent to that being that kind of person is the act of voting, right? So the idea is you want to basically imply through your messaging, right? That in order to be a union member, you have to vote. And more importantly, right? That you want to tie the act of voting and talk about it as a form of solidarity with other members of whatever that community is, which in this case, that is union members, right? Because at the end of the day, right, like we know, uh, voting isn't a specific duty, it's an identity. So we all know that Democrats have a turnout problem, right? Not just this election, but every election, right? We have a turnout problem. But one of the things this does is this helps to solve the long-term problem that Democrats have by tying the act of voting to being who you are. So if I identify at the end of the day as someone from Southern Appalachia, and I think that means to me, if it, if it means to me that uh, being someone from Southern Appalachia means voting, right? Then I will vote every time. If I think that in order to be a good union member, I have to vote, then I'll vote every time. So the idea is to tie those identities to the act of voting and vice versa. And that's the way that we can solve not just this democratic turnout problem, but all future democratic turnout problems as well. So, now that was a lot. 
that is the end of our presentation. Do y'all have any questions or thoughts on uh, how we use community messaging and how we apply it? There's a little Q&A thing as well, or we can put it in the chat as well. Do we always need to us the community first to be like we are part of the community? Is that what you're asking, Ali? So Ali's question was, do we always need to us the community first? Are you asking like to, like, to like, show identification with the community? While I get answer from us, uh, from Ali here, right? Uh, the anonymous attendee is how are you thinking about messaging around mail-in versus showing up at the polls with COVID and people of color uh, voters mistrusting of mail-in ballots? That's a really good, that's a really good uh, question. So uh, I don't know if you have a thought on this, Kelsey. If not, I can try to answer this one. I think that doing mail-in voting right now whatever community you identify with the most it's it's an act of love to to turn it in by mail rather than to put people at risk put your family at risk back at home by exposing yourself to more people so i think that that i think that's that would be the way that i would do it that it, no matter what your community is it's an act of love towards your community by to use it mail and voting or drop boxes rather than increasing risk that exact thing that i was yeah just to echo that point i thought you further exactly what kelsey has said right um, basically, like, hey, inherent, right? Do you want to be, let's say we're targeting to talking to union members, right? Being a good union member means not putting your fellow brothers and sisters in labor at risk, right? Because you want to vote in person, right? The idea is to like make messaging around mail and voting, right? Targeting those folks being like, in order to be a good member of this community, right? It involves, uh, it involves like voting by mail as a like act of love and act of solidarity with your community. Um, Ali's question, which is basically, do we always have to ID the community first? Uh, yes, you probably need to. Uh, that being said, there are very broad communities we can apply. So we can get down to hyper-localized communities and say, you know, your soccer player communities or your turf communities. But that's less easy, right? But, so you, but you can go for like the, the smaller community groups, like veterans or union workers or church goers or whatever else, as a first step, right, in that process of like taking your messaging and applying it to them and their community. Have you seen significant difference in turnout improvements around different demographic groups? So this was a thing that we, we, tr we started analyzing between the 2018 and 2020 cycle, right? Um, and we did not find a, a, a extreme variation in our turnout difference. I think it was like between like two to 4% depending on demographic group. I think uh, our program worked best uh, among those, uh, had a, an increased turnout among those that were like, uh, I think it was the 30, 30, to 35 to 50 year old bracket, uh, but nothing particularly outliery. Um, so across the board, it worked by, uh, it, what you're doing is you're not telling voters using the scripts we use. We're not telling voters, hey, as a member of this community, we're basically saying, what community do you identify as and how does voting impact that community? So the idea is to allow voters to self ID and almost like self tell them why voting matters to their community which I think is this really important middle thing, because that way you don't have to assume what communities they're part of. They basically get to tell you and then convince themselves to vote based on their own community. Any other questions that folks have? Oh, I think there is. What about messaging delivered on mobiles and bot chats? Any testing around that? 
Uh, we have not done, so we, we have not done testing of messaging around bot chats, right? We have done some testing of messaging around text messaging, and we have uh, there's a lot of information on the Analyst Institute's website suggesting that uh, using text messaging as a methodology to convince someone to vote doesn't have particularly good, uh, good results. There's like pretty poor results of using like texts as a way of uh, voter persuasion. The text messaging really only works as a voter information system, basically. And beyond that, it tends to typically struggle both in terms of uh, uh, get the vote messaging as well as like persuasion messaging. Also, if anyone uh, has any desire for this slide deck, I made it a PDF and I will drop it in the chat right now. Oh, the other side uses this so much, right? Like this is 110% I think Republicans have gotten very good at doing, right? They have very firmly tied the act of being an evangelical Christian to the act of voting Republican, right? Like this is a thing that they have done for a very long time. And so basically with like lots of shame messaging around this as well, right? Like if you are not voting Republican and you are an evangelical Christian, right? Then like you are a bad evangelical Christian, right? I don't know, Kelsey, so there was a question in the chat was, does the other side use this as well, thinking about how they made Christian identities synonymous with voting? Do you have any thoughts on that as well? I uh, just echo exactly what you said. They're experts at it. They know how to vote for the Supreme Court, where uh, as Democrats, sometimes we're not always as good at carrying that message through. Um, and yeah, I also just wanted to kind of piggybacking on that. I just wanted to uplift what Tim said in the chat. Voting is community care messaging can help us with mobilizing progressives who are fed up with the Dems. Yes, yeah, sometimes we vote harm reduction and thinking about yourself as a part of a greater community when you're making that act of voting, I think is, is powerful. There's actually a really interesting study related to the uh, Christian identity point here. There's a really interesting study on Republican primary voters uh, in 2016, basically suggesting that those with the least access to community voted for Trump over Cruz or Kasich. Where, like, it wasn't necessarily an economic vote, it was an economic vote tied to community identity and lack thereof. And they're basically that, therefore, essentially, uh, Republican, like, a lot of Trumpian Republican rhetoric comes from folks that don't have identities um, wrapped up in their communities. How does this work in primaries where policy is more important? Thinking about how turning up primary turnout can impact general election turnout, or does dynamic social expression work only in general elections? Dynamic social expression works everywhere, right? So dynamic social expression basically is all about the idea of like, tie, so in this case here for your primary, right? It's like in our case, we're talking about identifying people that are already ID, ID Democrats that we're just talking about voting in general. In this case here, right, you, where you want to convince whatever person to work one way, I'd make the case that this is one of the primary reasons why the Warren campaign failed, right? Is that basically this 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 latching onto policy against community, right? As a way of like there was there was no uh, like advanced follow up on this afterward of like yeah this is why this policy impacts your community, right? Uh, it was just look at this policy that is great and lovely for policy junkies like myself that can talk policy all day long, but for the app for the most voters, right? Who wants to know cool how does this affect my lived experience and the lived experience of the lives of the people I care about? Right. So the idea is if you're in a primary setting and you're running on primary policy messaging, right, your primary policy messaging should be entirely based on, right, how does this policy impact the communities that you are a part of, right? And how does this, this and not just like what is the policy, how, what is the policy and how does it impact whatever else going on? Uh, there was a thing about how do you initially identify who to target. Uh, I think that kind of depends on what kind of messaging you're wanting to run, right? So like where you are and what kind of campaign you're running in. If you're running in a general campaign, then in our case, you want to target people that are Democrats as a whole, right? And then uh, a lot of a lot of different scoring uh, organizations and data will you'll give you access to like, we're pretty sure this person's a veteran. We're pretty sure this person's a whatever else. 
I believe, yeah. So that way, basically, we are that way you're able to like use the data we get in that regard. How can this be used to boost Latinx turnout, considering there are such varied identities and communities in the wider Latinx community? That's a good point. That's a good question. Um, do you have thoughts on that, Kelsey? If not, I can. I think I have a couple. Um, not a lot, but I would maybe point out that. You, Latinx would not be, of course, their only identity. We talked about having a myriad of identities, so they, they, it may be appealing to a religious identity, uh, to a class identity, to a, a, a social identity. So I, I think just uh, understanding that there, no person is a monolith and uh, appealing to all sides of them and all the communities that we're a part of um, would be the best approach. Um, so I think one of the things related, yeah, related to that as well, or if you wanted to target like the Latinx community more broadly, right, you could target the specific subsets of the Latinx community, right? Latinx community tends to be uh, a pretty, pretty staggered on like uh, national origin lines, right? Of like, you know, you have like Mexican Americans, Puerto, Ric Puerto Ricans, Cuban Americans, Nicaraguan Americans, Venezuelan Americans, et cetera, right? And so you can make, uh, like, if you're working in Miami, right, talk about how it works, how, how being a Cuban American relates to the act of voting and the act of voting for whatever candidate that you're talking about, or the act of, like, and how this will support the Cuban American experience and what it means to be Cuban American or Mexican American or whatever else, or do it, or hitting what Kelsey said, right, and going, yes, this is too big a moniker. It's too hard to, to talk about what it means to be Latinx more broadly, because, like, yes, do a lot of, uh, do a lot of Latinx folks identify, you know, with being Latinx or being Hispanic or whatever? Yes, but a lot of times that's a, that's a, that's a lower tier identity where, where a lot of times folks who identify first being Mexican American and then whatever else and eventually getting down to either Latinx or Hispanic. Um, there was a question about, uh, are you familiar with the Peoria project? And if so, how much do you pull it into targeting your work? I am not familiar with the Peoria project. Uh, I don't know if you are, Kelsey. I've not heard of them before. I am not. Uh, that's a that's the first time I've heard of them. But quick Google search, it it looks pretty uh, similar or uh, core to kind of what we what we what we do. Uh, first line here on their website is to convince people to take civic action or shift their opinions. You first need to understand how they think, feel, and frame the world. So I think that's absolutely uh, speaking to the core of dynamic social expression. Thank you for that 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 link drop. That was yes. I want to I'm going to do more looking into that. I think this is going to kick us off automatically in like three minutes. Is there any last questions that folks have? Yeah, of course. Thank you, Adam. I, I will gladly look into this. This seems very much right up our alley. Definitely want to say thank you guys for coming and thank you for being uh, so engaged. This was a lot of fun. Yep. Thank you all. Oh, okay. oh sure. Um, Hope that went well for you. All right, yeah, I did. Are we good to sign off then? Uh, oh, yes, actually. All right. Uh, thank you, and yeah. sorry for, for the troubles. Um, no, you're good. Okay, thank you. We'll see you. Have a good Saturday. Thanks, Kelsey. Thanks, you too.